So um, now, just to introduce myself, um, Monica Radcliffe, uh, I'm the center director of Set Squared in Bristol. Uh, Set Squared is an incubator for tech businesses. And just as a disclaimer, I've never actually had an exit myself. So I'm not an expert. And I'm not a corporate finance person. I'm not any type of finance person. So just bear that in mind that I'm not an expert in exits. Um, but what I'm talking about is from my experience of working with the companies that we have in the incubator. Um, right now, we have 85 tech startups that we're working with um, and incubating them. Um, but over the last 17 years of existence, um, Set Squad uh, has worked with 250 startups. And uh, uh, 80 of those had fundraisers and 20 of those exited. So it's quite interesting working with, um, I haven't worked directly with all of them, but with quite a few of them I work with directly. Um, and uh, observing their process and learning from, from them was actually quite insightful for me. Um, and just to give you examples of some of those, um, these are some of the recent exits that happened um, over the last few years. Um, so what's really interesting here is actually, um, just looking at it, Pelipot is a very clever business that was basically a box uh, that you put out of outside of your house that accepts your parcels when you're not in. How clever is that, right? <laughs> so none of us are never at home to actually accept the parcel and then you have to go to post office to pick it up. Um, so this box uh, was able to um, the, the postman was able to open the access the, the box uh, and he could accept digital signatures um, that you sort of pre-programmed pre there and even take a picture of the parcel that you had in the box so you get a confirmation while you're at work, you got a parcel. And um, very interesting, uh, clever technology and uh, interestingly BT uh, got interest in it. And why? Because they have so many thousands of those engineers being out and about and their interest was, was in it actually use that box for keeping parts and safely storing and registering parts that those engineers are using. So not even anything to do with the parcels, but the technology found a different type of application. Uh, and Pelipod got acquired by BT. So uh, a local, local company acquired by quite a large, uh, well-known brand. Uh, and interestingly, they've never actually had any funding even. So it was all organic growth and got acquired. So great story. Um, similarly, another one that uh, actually the next two have either also never had any funding in the business. So it was all organic growth. Uh, Screen Time Labs uh, was a, or still is a, is a tech startup that um, monitors the time your uh, children spend on devices. So it was well before the Apple introduced uh, Screen Time as part of your settings. Um, but you could, pro for, for example, program it that uh, your kids across their iPads and tablets and Macs, um, across multiple devices, their, their devices switch off after an hour a day, let's say, or something like that. So you could really monitor that. And uh, American business, uh, awareness technologies got uh, very interested in them um, when screen time reached to reach $1 million revenue through organic growth. So they were like, wow, they're onto something. We'd like to acquire a slice of UK market. And they, they bought them. Uh, my action replay, um, a business that, uh, again, another one from our incubator that has developed the technology that um, you put a camera on a football stadium, a local stadium, so it's not about sort of big games, it's about local games. And whenever there's a really interesting action going on, you can, anyone can just press the button and it, it records the previous 60 seconds. So it's actually, uh, instead of recording the whole game, it, it records a really interesting moment that people are interested in, in capturing. They got acquired by a New Zealand-based uh, company. And then the, the last two are really uh, huge success stories. So Second Sync um, was a Bristol-based business that uh, was a second UK Twitter acquisition. Um, and again, brilliant technology. They have had rounds of funding when they got to it but they were uh, doing Twitter analytics of um, engagement when people are watching TV. So for example, when uh, you're watching your favorite TV show, it's actually how many people at the same time engage in on Twitter. So having that combined enga engagement was really valuable in terms of data. Uh, and the, the final one is a biotech acquisition that really helped um, 
helped us uh, help uh, Bristol and Bath sort of become a biotech uh, centre, biotech cluster last year when Xylo got acquired by Novodorsk in a deal of up to 800 million last year. So as we see, biotech is a whole, <laughs> whole another world uh, in terms of the value of those businesses if they have got a really valuable science and, and innovation behind them. It's, it's really um, interesting. So those are just examples of companies that I've engaged with, just to give you a sample. So and now let's think about you and, um, and, and your exit plans. So out of those people that have said uh, are running a business or thinking of starting a business, have you got a startup exit plan in mind already? Anyone? Any yeses? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's very common. I mean, very often you're passionate about a startup and you start with solving a problem or you got an idea, you follow that, you build a team, you get some funding and you just get so busy running a business, right? You don't think about, oh, okay, what's going to happen in six years time is like a long time away. So don't really think about it now. Um, but actually uh, where it all starts is actually thinking about yourselves. So it's all about you. So what I'd like to encourage you, and maybe this is a slightly different thing about different approach of thinking about exit, is that what do you, as you an individual, want to get out of your business? So if you're thinking about, okay, the business might exit in five, six year, years' time, what do you want to get out of it at the end? Why are you working so hard? And maybe, maybe you know, the answer is, oh, I want my technology to be used around the world and and and, and creating you know, having a good effect on people or other businesses or, or whatever it is that drives you. But have a big think about what is it that drives you and what is it that we want to achieve at the end. Because I really think it's really important to remind yourself of that end goal when you're starting. And um, many of the entrepreneurs do it for the money, or many, many entrepreneurs do it, uh, the money for them is a sort of side effect. But what I'd like to encourage you is to think about if you're hoping to get some money out of it at the end, how much money is that? Like, how much money do you actually need for yourself to consider a success? If the business was sold in five years' time, how much you'd like to get out of it? Think about all the sweat equity you've put into it, all the time you put into it. Maybe you're living on a minimum salary on just that pays the bills and you're hoping, okay, the payoff will come later. How much is that payoff? We never actually think about that, you know, how much that actually is. Um, and it, what's really interesting is actually think about it, uh, and, and I would encourage you to write it down. So I've had uh, entrepreneurs in my incubator that actually have written a check to themselves with a date of 2023. And this is the kind of their goal. And, you know, we probably heard it from other people. People have this, is, this is their goal in mind, that this is how much they'd like to make in five, ten years' time. And have it in your world as a reminder. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a place to start. Start with yourself and where you'd like to be and how much you'd like to get out of it and kind of what is your mission and your goal here. And then you have to think about your co-founders and your team. Um, so I think that's another thing that many people forget is that uh, you start, very often you start a business with, with a team, with, with a team of co-founders. It's not only one single person. And very rarely people have those kind of money conversations at the beginning. And money seems to be that this taboo topic. But actually, I really would encourage you to sit down with your co-founders and have that conversation now when you start a business uh, to talk about what is that number for you, but also what is that number for them. Because if you don't have it, then five years down the line, the call will come with a, from a potential acquirer who will say, oh, I want to buy your business for five million. And, um, and your co-founder goes, yeah, let's sell. And you're thinking, well, no, I wanted to get 10 million out of it. And then you fall out. 
and the whole business falls out. And then you have those massive disagreements. Then you realize, oh, you forgot a shareholding agreement to be written at the very beginning, and there's some issues. So I would encourage you to think about it now with your co-founders. Sit down, have a proper chat, and agree what is your number, what is their number. And if it's very different, talk about how you compromise. Kind of what is your combined goal? Because you have to work as a team uh, towards that exit and towards that number. And now, okay, so let's say you got that. You know what you're working for. You know what's your number in five years' time. Um, and the next step to figure out is what should your business be worth? Okay, so let's say you want about five million in five years' time. What should your business be worth? And very important, remember dilution. Because you may have 100% now or 50% or 33% or depending on how many co-founders you have. Um, but as you start growing, you may start bringing other team members that you may decide to give option shares to them. You may start bringing investors that you give uh, equity to. Um, there could be lots of other things that happen along the way. And your share percentage will, will be diluted. So have a think about it now and have a think about, okay, what's your plan over those three, five, ten years? How many the funding rounds do you want to have? How, what is your option pool for your employees? And think about all those places. Yeah. We don't know that. That's that's secret information. <laughs> I I can't tell you. <laughs> Even if I knew, I wouldn't be able to tell you because we uh, <laughs> we we're very confidential with the data regarding our startups. But they haven't actually disclosed that to anyone, and that's that's absolutely normal. Not not you know very rarely people do that. Uh, but it's quite not you know it's very normal that you know by the time you've had several rounds, your 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 own um, shareholding may go to a single digit. But, uh, but remember that, that this single digit will be, much, uh, will be worth much more than your 100% now when the business is worth nothing, right? So you have to consider that. And then the next step uh, is actually thinking about how would you value your business? And you know, for, my, for many of you, or most of you, it's too early to value the business. But actually, what, what, what does it hurt you to actually think about how do I value my business now? Because if you don't know how to value it now, how would you know how to do it in five years' time? Uh, how would you know if someone calls you and offers you five million, that is a lot or not enough? You wouldn't know unless you actually work it out for yourself. And there's so many evaluation techniques. If you Google that subject, will be hundreds of different techniques. So there's no, um, there's no one um, correct answer uh, for this question of how do you actually value your business. And if you talk to businesses that have exited, they all have different ways of doing that. So um, when I did my own search online, thinking about, OK, what can I show you? I've actually come up with someone <laughs> that I couldn't, I couldn't sort of give you, OK, this is, these are the top three. But I've come across one really interesting article on Medium. So if you want to look it up, it's by Stephanie Nesser, who describes those seven, uh, sorry, those nine valuation techniques. And I would encourage you to actually pick several and run those on your own business. So I know some people can read it from the back. So very quickly, I read it through. Um, number one, Berkus, valuation based on assessment of five key success factors. Number two, risk factor summation, valuation based on the value. Uh, base value adjusted for 12 standard risk factors. Another one, scorecard, valuation based on a weighted average value adjusted for a similar company. For comparable transactions, valuation based on a rule of three with a KPI from a similar company. So let's, for example, take that just to explain. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. You can read about them online. But this one, for example, comparable transaction, valuation based on a rule of three with a KPI from a similar company. Let's say you are um, I don't know, an ed tech company that has a platform engaging students um, uh, to give them information about their future careers. And you've come across a similar business in US that has sold recently 
and they have had, I don't know, 100,000 active users. Um, and they've also had a, let's say, six minute engagement time for each one of them on a monthly basis. And they have, um, I don't know, 40% uh, new customer acquisition on a monthly basis. So th th these are where the free KPIs you found out for them. And now you look at your own statistics. How many users do you have? What's your retention? Um, how long you retain customers on your website? And uh, how, you, how quickly you get new customers? And compare that to their business. Let's say their business sold for 10 million. Yours comparably will be 3 million. <coughs> so that's just an example of one evaluation methodology. Obviously, the difficulty with us, that is about finding out what are their KPIs, and you rarely find it online. So it's about how much information you can get. Um, another one, book value, evaluation based on the tangible assets of a company, liquidation value, evaluation based on the scrap value of the tangible assets, this discounted cash flow, evaluation based on the sum of all future cash flow generated. So this one, for example, is about if you sell product online, um, <coughs> um, let's give an example of a, um, I don't know, a subscri subscri subscription based company. So you estimate that your business will live for another 10 years. You've got X number of customers now paying that amount of subscription, and you estimate that kind of growth over the years, and those number of customers and the money you generate. So you calculate all of the future money you will ever generate from your revenue, but then you discount them against the current value. So that's just another one. Um, first, Chicago, valuation based on a weighted average of three valuation scenarios, and venture capital, uh, valuation based on the ROI expected by investor. And this is an interesting one, because eventually, uh, your business will only going to be ever worth what? the acquirer will be willing to pay for. So this is about actually checking of your investors. If the investors are willing to give you, I don't know, 200K for 20% of the company because they believe the pre-money valuation is a million, but they also expect return on investment 10 times in the future. So kind of that gives you an idea of how much they, they think it will be worth. But then bear in mind that their negotiating position is to make sure they get as much equity for as little money as possible. So not all investors will give you a true valuation. Obviously, they'll try to keep it down. But there's lots of different techniques that you can find. And the idea behind this is I would encourage you to just go online um, and pick a couple of them and run those calculations for yourselves. Um, but then you can also ask for advice. And most of the lawyers, most of, most of the accountants will give you initial advice for free. Uh, and especially there's around, uh, around here, around Bristol and there's several, couple, uh, several corporate uh, finance companies. So corporate finance firms are actually firms that, um, that specialize in securing funding for you or specialize in taking you for a, for a merger of an acquisition or just acquisition. And they will obviously charge for it. So that's their, that's their business. So there's two, for example, that I know, Shaw and Co and Acuity, that some of our companies work with. But what they did is basically they had an um, appointment free of charge at the beginning of their startup journey just to find out, okay, how do I value my, my business? What do you think it can be worth? Just having that conversation, I think, is just helpful to get some advice from experts. <laughs> and then... Um, now you've got those numbers, okay, you know how much you want out of your business, you know how much your business should be worth for you to get that number. Imagine yourself crossing that line. Imagine yourself in five years' time when you're actually starting the business for that amount of money. Imagine how the business has to look like at that point. Five years from now, or you know, whatever your time scale is, how much money do you have to be generating? Uh, for that amount of revenue, how many customers do you need to have? How big is your team? Just put yourself in a situation of having, of running that business that, of that size. And that will give you an idea of, okay, where do I need to get to? And then work backwards. So if this is a plan, three-year plan or 10-year plan, 
think about, okay, year earlier, where am I? How, you know, how much money do I need to be making? And, and so on. So make a plan based on that, and, but start with an end, end with, a, with in mind. Um, and then work backwards to make your plan for the next couple of years. And then you see if it's realistic. I think that's a much better way of actually thinking about, okay, is this going to happen? Is it realistic for me to, to achieve this? Um, so, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, making a, a plan. And also having that plan in mind will help you not get distracted. Because very often for entrepreneurs, um, you know, you live for the technologies you've built. So sometimes it's like, oh, there's another, another cool thing I could use this technology for and another market I, I could go to and, and, and do something different with this technology. But actually that, let's say, once you have made a plan, you realize, oh, but I will add another two years to my plan because if I need to go this way, that's how long it will take me to develop this kind of user base. So just bear that in mind that um, having that kind of plan now will help you stay on track uh, for when you get distracted. <clears throat>